I hope that you've gotten a lot out of these videos so far. I hope that you've, you know, learned to deal with some of your anxiety. And when you get up to give a public speech next time, I hope that you are not worried about it. I hope that you have learned how to turn your uh, debilitating fears into empowering fear so you can step out and do what's right. I hope you've learned a lot. I hope you've gotten something out of it. But I got to tell you that right now is when we're going to start to get into the meat of public speaking. That's right. We're going to start talking about one of those five canons that I talked about in the last video. In the last video, I told you about invention, arrangement, style, memory, and delivery. And today we're going to hit on delivery. There's a reason that we're going to start right out with delivery. It's what makes a speech different from a paper, different from something you write. The delivery, the, the parts of the speech that aren't about the words you say, but about the way you say it. That's something that's important. Can you learn, you know, good invention, good style, good arrangement in other classes? Yeah. In other places, you can sure learn that. But you want to learn good delivery, you're going to learn that from a speech teacher. And that's what I am. Delivery is all the aspects of your presentation which are nonverbal. We use that word a lot of times to talk about delivery and communication. We call it nonverbal communication. So nonverbal communication, what is that? What is nonverbal communication? Well, let me tell you. It's communication that is not verbal. That means it does not use verbiage. And verbiage is a fancy word for words. Nonverbal communication is the part that's not the words. The parts that are the words? Well, those could be oral. If I'm speaking out loud, I, that's, that's the words I'm using. Uh, that's, that's oral, those words. It can be written. When you see words on a page, or if I put words up on the screen for this video, that's a verbal. It's a verbal because it's words. And it can even be kinesic. In the case of sign language, when deaf people use sign language, they are communicating verbally because those signs are words. But when I move my hands, that's not verbal. That's nonverbal. Nonverbal communication has a few characteristics. See, sometimes in nonverbal communication, it can be intentional. Right now, when I move my hands, when I take these steps, when I do these gestures, when I move my little self all over the place in these videos, I am doing that on purpose. I'm doing it on purpose in order to make this into a good video for you. But sometimes I do things I didn't mean to do. Sometimes I might be communicating things I don't want to con communicate. Sometimes it is unintentional. And nonverbal communication is made up of multiple codes. What that means is we've got lots of nonverbal communication going on simultaneously. Right now I've got the way I'm moving, I've got my tone of voice, uh, I got the clothes I'm wearing, I have the way my hair is, all of this stuff is communicating something. It's all these different codes. And some of it might be communicating one thing, and some of it might be communicating another thing. It's all different. And occasionally, these messages are opposites. Sometimes we mean to communicate one thing, but we end up communicating another. Or sometimes we've got multiple communication going on simultaneously. Maybe you're giving a professional presentation, but you're not dressed professionally. Maybe you have, you look excited in your movements and you're talking and it sounds like there's something really great going on for you. But the way you look, you look like you maybe just crawled out of bed and not in your pajamas. Lots of things can be going on simultaneously. Some nonverbal communication is universal. Some nonverbal communication is culturally specific. Things like when you say something's about this big, if I go, you know I talked about something this big, this big, this big, and it doesn't matter what culture you're in. That's all the same. Most of our basic emotions are uh, 
are universal. A smile means happy in every culture. There's no culture where, oh, we smile when we are angry. Uh, now, you might smile when you're angry because you're crazy. That's possible, but not because that's appropriate nonverbal communication. Other culture, uh, other parts of our communication are culturally specific. You know what? I am 35 years old, and I'm mostly from Nebraska, and the panhandle of Nebraska, and I wouldn't say I'm an unemotional person, and I wouldn't even say that I don't express my affection physically. I do, but you know what? I haven't done in a number of years. I haven't kissed my dad, and you know what? I don't think it's very likely that I'm going to either. Now, you might be sitting there in, in your culture, even here in the United States, a co-culture, not terribly different than me, and think, what's wrong with that boy hasn't kissed his dad? You should kiss your dad. You love him, don't you? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I do. I, I love my dad, but I'm not going to kiss him. I'll hug him, shake his hand, and I'll give him a good big hug, but I'm not going to kiss him. In another culture, that's how I would show my affection. So it varies, sometimes communication, nonverbal communication varies from culture to culture. Nonverbal communication tends to work best when it is helping verbal communication. I could have gotten up and done this video and just gestured and just looked certain ways and just smiled. And maybe you could have gotten something out of it. That would have been cool. But it seems to work best because I'm using the nonverbal and the verbal. That's when it tends to work best. Nonverbal communication can be used to repeat. I can say, uh, my wife's about that tall. She's about that tall. Uh, I can say that, and when I say about that tall, it kind of repeats. I say, she's 5'3". That's how tall my wife is, about 5'3". And I can say, oh, okay, his wife is about that tall. It repeated what I said. It can be used to contradict. Yeah, Grandma, that tasted good. So you, you do that, the nonverbals are telling you something other than what the verbals are telling you. It can be used to substitute. Uh, I need one about that big. One what? Who knows? But if you're in a place, if you're in a hardware store looking at bolts, and you say you need one about that big, they don't need to hear, I need a bolt about that big. It can be used to substitute. It can be used to accent. You've probably heard about those preachers who are called Bible beaters. And the reason they're called Bible beaters is because they beat their Bibles. That's why. That's why they're called Bible beaters. And so, let's see. I think I've got one. I know I have a Bible. Yep. Here's my Bible right here. So, I got my Bible, and I start preaching from it. And, 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 and I can say, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to hell. And then I do that. It beats the Bible and thumps and accents what I'm saying. It's great. They can be used to regulate. When I first started teaching, I, I had a terrible time because I, I, I would be afraid to ask my students questions. Because I thought, if I ask my students a question and they raise their hand, what if, I, what if I can't remember their name? Because, you know, I have 100 students. What if I can't remember one of their names? And they raise their hand. And I can't say, okay, Timothy, it's you. Uh, what, what am I going to do? And I asked somebody who had been teaching a while, and they, and they said, well, you just look at them. You just look at them. Are you saying because I'm a professor now, I have psychic powers? I didn't really say that, but, you know, that was kind of the thing. But I tried it. I tried it a little while later. Somebody, I, I asked a question, somebody raised my hand, and I just... And they knew it was their turn. Nonverbal communication can be used, along with verbal communication, to regulate. Nonverbal communication is carried through all of the five sentences, senses, touch, smell, taste, sight, and sound. You might be thinking, well, I see sight and sound. Well, you don't see sound, but you know what I'm saying? Uh, touch, smell, taste, sight, sound. I'm going to look in today's video about touch, smell, and taste. Sight and sound are probably a little more important to your public speeches, so I'm going to take a video each for them. But in the next video, in these videos, I'm going to talk about touch, smell, and taste. Now, touch 
is something we communicate. We communicate lots of things through touch. Like I said, I hug my dad. I kiss my wife. I hold her hand. Sometimes at night, she's like rolling around in bed, and I just kind of reach over and put my hand on her shoulder, and she so calms down because she knows I said there, and she knows I love her, and I communicated that without saying anything because I would have been too tired to talk anyway. We communicate lots of things through, through touch. Sometimes uh, we communicate affection through touch. Uh, there have been times and places where certain people have decided that they needed to communicate through something through touch, and so they touched somebody hard, fast, and repeatedly. They communicated something through touch. But touch is culturally regulated and is regulated in all cultures. You're not going to find a culture where there's anybody in the culture who can touch anybody they want anytime they want. That's just not going to happen. Uh, that, that doesn't happen. T cult touch is always culturally re regulated. But in different cultures, it is sometimes regulated different ways. So as you're interacting with other cultures, you need to remember they may touch in different ways at different times to communicate different things than you do in your culture. So that's something to keep in mind. We also have to think about how, we, how things touch or how things come close to touching. See, everybody has their own space, their own territory. Um, and we talk about this territory for, for when people can come close to touching you. The biggest part of our territory is what we call our public territory. And that goes out from about our bodies to about 25 feet. Really, without any electronic help, you should probably not even give a public speech to people further than 25 feet away from you. They're not going to hear you well. They're not going to see you well. Now, if you've got microphones or you've got uh, cameras or something like that, well, you're watching this video right now, and who knows how far away you might be. You could be in China. I don't know. But all of this stuff, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, you don't want to get it any further than 25 feet. From about 4 feet to 12 feet in front of you is a little further away. We call that our social space. You know, your friends come into your social space. 4 feet, 12 feet. You interact with people who aren't even really quite your friends. They're more like your acquaintances. About four feet away, you have a conversation. You have a conversation. You're just not too close together. Closer than that is your personal space. Uh, your personal space is from about one and a half feet in front of you to about four feet in front of you. That's about how far away your personal space is. Uh, your personal space, you know, kind of figure just a, a little bit further than it takes for you to swing your arms. And you know what? If somebody gets in your personal space and they stay there and they haven't been invited, it gets a little unpleasant. See, that's not your social space. When somebody is your good friend and they're in your personal space, or if somebody is your lover and they're in your personal space, that's okay. In fact, some people might even get closer. Up to your skin to about a foot and a half away is your intimate space. Now we can sometimes, because we have to pass through each other's intimate space, but if you come into somebody's intimate space and stay there, if you get in their face, there's really only two reasons to do that. One is to be intimate, uh, to kiss or to cuddle somebody who you really, really care about. And the other reason is to fight. And that's why we don't like it when people get into our face. And so you need to be aware of that. When you're giving your speech, it's a good idea. Don't let it get more than 25 feet away from you. But really do try and walk around a little bit. And try and make sure that at some point in your presentation, everybody does get into your social sp space, the 4 to 12 feet. Probably in a public speech, you should avoid getting into people's personal or intimate space. We also have to communicate nonverbally through smell. Just this morning, I got up, I took a shower. Uh, before I, I, I 
you know, get in the shower and I, I put some some smelly stuff in my hand and I rub it in my hair and then I get some other, then I rinse it off, but it leaves behind the smell, hopefully it takes off the oil and grease. Then I put some other uh, smelly stuff in my hair. Uh, I Then I cover myself in, in some smelly stuff, some soap, and then I rinse that off and I hope that I'm taking other things off and leaving the smell behind. I get out, get out, I put on some deodorant, you know, I put on the deodorant, and that isn't really deodorant, is it? Oh, no. Some of you might be deer hunters or something, and you know that you can buy true deodorant. Stuff with no smell, but the stuff we put on, most of the days before work, it has a smell. And we have that smell so that we communicate something. Uh, I put on the deodorant. Sometimes I'll splash on a little cologne. Put on my first layer of clothing. I always wear two layers. Put on my first layer of clothing. And I usually hit that with body spray afterwards. Then I put on my other shirt. I do all of that, not so I don't smell bad. See, this is a confusing thing that some people think, oh, well, you do that so you don't smell bad. Uh-uh. If that were the case, if I was doing that so I wouldn't smell bad, I would put on all kinds of no odor neutralizing stuff. Oh, no. I do it so I smell good because I want to make a good impression on people. You know what? I'm not going to be able to, if I see your speeches through video, know your smell, but your audience will. And if you don't smell right for your audience, they might reject what you're saying. We do lots of other smelly things at different times. We'll make coffee just for the smell. We'll burn incense. Uh, we'll put in...